that's all splendid thought kitty catching the words all that's just as it should be and a smile of happiness unconsciously reflected in every one who looked at her beamed on put it on quite voices were heard urging when the priest had put on the wedding crowns and sherbatsky his hand shaking in its three-button glove held the crown high above her head put it on she whispered smiling levin looked round at her and was struck by the joyful radiance on her face and unconsciously her feeling infected him he too like her felt glad and happy they enjoyed hearing the epistle read and the roll of the head deacon's voice at the last verse awaited with such impatience by the outside public they enjoyed drinking out of the shallow cup of warm red wine and water and they were still more pleased when the priest flinging back his stole and taking both their hands in his led them a spark of joy kindled and kitty seemed to have infected every one in the church it seemed to levin that the priest and the deacon too wanted to smile just as he did taking the crowns off their heads the priest read the last prayer and congratulated the young people levin looked at kitty and he had never before seen her look as she did she was charming with the new radiance of happiness in her face. Levin longed to say something to her, but he did not know whether it was all over. The priest got him out of his difficulty. He smiled his kindly smile and said gently, Kiss your wife, and you kiss your husband, and took the candles out of their hands. Levin kissed her smiling lips with timid care, gave her his arm, and with a new strange sense of closeness, walked out of the church he did not believe he could not believe that it was true it was only when their wondering and timid eyes met that he believed in it because he felt that they were one after supper the same night the young people left for the country chapter seven vronsky and anna had been traveling for three months together in europe they had visited venice rome and naples and had just arrived at a small Italian town where they meant to stay some time. A handsome head waiter, with thick pomaded hair parted from the neck upwards, an evening coat, a broad white cambric shirt front, and a bunch of trinkets hanging above his rounded stomach, catching the sound of footsteps coming from the other side of the entry towards the staircase. The head waiter turned round, and seeing the Russian count, who had taken their best rooms, he took the steward was prepared to sign the agreement. Ah, I'm glad to hear it, said Vronsky. Is Madame at home or not? Medine has been out for a walk but has returned now, answered the waiter. Vronsky took off his soft, wide-brimmed hat and passed his handkerchief over his heated brow and hair, which had grown half over his ears, and was brushed back, covering the bold patch, and glancing casually at the gentleman, who still stood there gazing intently at him he would have gone on this gentleman is a russian and was inquiring after you said the head waiter with mingled feelings of annoyance at never being able to get away from acquaintances anywhere and longing to find some sort of diversion from the monotony of his life vronsky looked once more at the gent golenishchev vronsky it really was golenishchev a comrade of vronsky's in the corpse of pages in the corpse Golanishchev had belonged to the Liberal Party. He left the corpse without entering the army, and had never taken office under the government. Vronsky and he had gone completely different ways on leaving the corpse, and had only met once since. At that meeting Vronsky perceived that Golanishchev had taken up a sort of lofty, intellectually liberal line, and was consequently disposed to look down upon Vronsky's interests and call Hence Vronsky had met him with the chilling and haughty manner he so well knew how to assume, the meaning of which was, You may like or dislike my way of life. That's a matter of the most perfect. This second meeting might have been expected. One would have supposed to estrange them still more. But now they beamed and exclaimed with delight on recognizing one another. Vronsky would never have expected to be so pleased to see Golanishchev but probably he was not himself aware how bored he was. He forgot the disagreeable impression of their last meeting, and with a face of frank delight held out his hand to his old comrade. The same expression of delight replaced the look of uneasiness on Golanishchev's face. 
how glad I am to meet you, said Vronsky, showing his strong white teeth in a friendly smile. I heard the name Vronsky, but I didn't know which one. I'm very, very glad. Let's go in. Come, tell me what you were doing. I've been living here for two years. I'm working. I said Vronsky, with sympathy. Let's go in. And with the habit common with Russians, instead of saying in Russian what he wanted to keep from the... Do you know, Madame Karenina? We are traveling together. I am going to see her now, he said in French, carefully scrutinizing Golanishchev's face. I did not know, though he did know. Golanishchev answered carelessly. Have you been here long? He added. Four days? Vronsky answered, once more scrutinizing his friend's face intently. Yes. He's a decent fellow. And will look at the thing properly, Vronsky said to himself, catching the significance of Golanishchev's face and the change of subject. I can introduce him to Anna. He looks at it properly. During those three months that Vronsky had spent abroad with an Anna, he had always on meeting new people asked, but if he had been asked, and those who looked at it properly had been asked, exactly how they did look at it, both he and they would have been greatly puzzled to answer. In reality, those who in Vronsky's opinion had the proper view had no sort of view at all, but behaved in general as well-bred persons do behave in regard to all the complex and insoluble problems. They assumed an air of fully comprehending the import and force of the situation, of accepting and even approving of it, but of considering it superfluous and uncalled for to put all this into work. Vronsky at once divined that Golanishchev was of this class, and therefore was doubly pleased to see him. And in fact, Golanishchev's manner to Medin Karenina, when he was taken to call on her, was all that Vronsky could have desired. Obviously, without the slightest effort, he steered clear of all subjects which might lead to embarrassment. He had never met Anna before, and was struck by her beauty, and still more by the frankness with which she accepted her position. She blushed when Vronsky brought in Golanishchev, and he was extremely charmed by this childish blush overspreading her candid and handsome face. But what he liked particularly was the way in which at once, as though on purpose that there might be no misunderstanding with an outsider, she called Vronsky simply Alexei, and said they were moving Golanishchev liked this direct and simple attitude to her own position. Looking at Anna's manner of simple-hearted, spirited gaiety, and knowing Alexei Alexandrovich and Vronsky, Golanishchev fancied that he understood her perfectly. He fancied that he understood what she was utterly unable to understand, how it was that, having made her husband wretched, having abandoned him and her son and lost her good name. It's in the guidebook, said Golanishchev, referring to the palace Vronsky had taken. There's a first-rate Tintoretto there, one of his latest period. I tell you what, it's a lovely day. Let's go and have another look at it, said Vronsky, addressing Anna. I shall be very glad, too. I'll go and put on my hat. Would you say it's hot? She said, stopping short in the doorway and looking inquiringly at Vronsky. And again a vivid flush overspread her face. Vronsky saw from her eyes that she did not know on what terms he cared to be with Golanishchev, and so was afraid of not behaving as he would wish. He looked a long, tender look at her. No, not very, he said. And it seemed to her that she understood everything. Most of all that he was pleased with her, and smiling to him, she walked with her rapid step out at the door. The friends glanced at one another, and a look of hesitation came into both faces, as though Golanishchev, unmistakably admiring her, would have liked to say something about her. And, well then, Vronsky began to start a conversation of some sort. So you were settled here? You were still at the same work, then? He went on, recalling that he had, yes, I'm writing the second part of the two elements, said Golanishchev, coloring with pleasure at the question, that is to be exact, I am not writing it yet. It will be a far wider scope, and will touch on almost all questions. 
we in Russia refuse to see that we are the heirs of Byzantium, and he launched into a long and heated explanation of his views. Vronsky at the first moment felt embarrassed at not even knowing of the first part of the two elements, of which the author spoke as something well known. But as Golanishchev began to lay down his opinions and Vronsky was able to follow them even without knowing the two elements, he listened to him with some interest, for Golanishchev spoke well. But Vronsky was startled and annoyed by the nervous irascibility with which Golanishchev talked of the subject that engrossed him. As he went on talking, his eyes glittered more and more angrily. He was more and more hurried in his replies to imaginary opponents, and his face grew more and more excited and warm. Remembering Golanishchev, a thin, lively, good-natured and well-bred boy, always at the head of the class, Vronsky could not make out the reason of his irritability. What he particularly disliked was that Golanishchev, a man belonging to a good set, should put himself on a level with some scribbling fellows, with whom he was irritated and angry. Was it worth it? Vronsky disliked it, yet he felt that Golanishchev was unhappy and was sorry for him. Unhappiness, almost mental derangement, was visible on his mobile, rather handsome face, while without even noticing Anna's coming in, he went on hurriedly, and when Anna came in in her hat and cape, and her lovely hand rapidly swinging her parasol, and stood beside him, it was with a feeling of relief that Vronsky broke away from the plaintive eye. Golanishchev recovered himself with an effort, and at first was dejected and gloomy, but Anna, disposed to feel friendly with everyone as she was at that time, soon revived his spirits, but after trying various subjects of conversation, she got him upon painting, of which he talked very well, and she listened to him attentively. They walked to the house they had taken, and looked over it. I am very glad of one thing, said Anna to Golanishchev when they were on their way back. Alexey will have a capital atelier. You must certainly take that room, she said to Vronsky in Russian using the affectionately familiar form as though she saw that Golanishchev would become intimate with them in their isolation. And, Do you paint? said Golanishchev, turning round quickly to Vronsky. Yes. I used to study long ago, and now I have begun to do a little, said Vronsky, reddening. He has great talent, said Anna with a delighted smile. I'm no judge, of course. But good judges have said the same. Chapter 8 Anna, in that first period of her emancipation and rapid return to health, felt herself unpardonably happy and full of the joy. The thought of her husband's unhappiness did not poison her happiness. On one side that memory was too awful to be thought of. On the other side her husband's unhappiness had given her too much happiness to be regretted. The memory of all that had happened after her illness, her reconciliation with her husband, its breakdown, the news of Vronsky's wound, his visit, the preparations for divorce, the thought of the harm caused to her husband aroused in her a feeling like repulsion, and akin to what a drowning man might feel who has shaken off another man clinging to him. That man did drown. It was an evil action, of course, but it was the sole means of escape, and better not to brood over these fearful facts. One consolatory reflection upon her conduct had occurred to her at the first moment of the final rupture, and when now she recalled all the past, she remembered that one reflection. I have inevitably made that man wretched, she thought, but I don't want to profit by his misery. I too am suffering, and shall suffer. I am losing what I prized above everything, I am losing my good name and my son. I have done wrong, and so I don't want happiness. I don't want a divorce, and shall suffer from my shame and the separation from my child, but however sincerely Anna had meant to suffer, shame there was not. With the tact of which both had such a large share, they had succeeded in avoiding Russian ladies abroad, and so had never placed themselves in a false position, and everywhere they had met people, separation from the son she loved, even that did not cause her anguish in these early days. The baby girl, his child, was so sweet, and had so won Anna's heart, since she was all that was left her, 
that Anna rarely thought of her son. The desire for life, waxing stronger with recovered health, was so intense, and the conditions of life were so new and pleasant that Anna felt unpardonably happy. The more she got to know Vronsky, the more she loved him. She loved him for himself and for his love for her. Her complete ownership of him was a continual joy to her. His presence was always sweet to her. All the traits of his character, which she learned to know better and better, were unutterably dear to her. His appearance, changed by his civilian dress, was as fascinating to her as though she were some young girl in love. In everything he said, thought, and did, she saw something particularly noble and elevated. Her adoration of him alarmed her indeed. She sought and could not find in him anything not fine. She dared not show him her sense of her own insignificance beside him. It seemed to her that, knowing this, he might sooner cease to love her. And she dreaded nothing now so much as losing his love, though she had no grounds for fearing it. But she could not help being grateful to him for his attitude to her, and showing that she appreciated it. He, who had in her opinion such a marked aptitude for a political career, in which he would have been certain to play a leading part, he had sacrificed his ambition for her sake, and never betrayed the slight. He was more lovingly respectful to her than ever, and the constant care that she should not feel the awkwardness of her position never deserted him for a single instant. He, so manly a man, never opposed her, had indeed, with her, no will of his own, and was anxious, it seemed, for nothing but to anticipate her wish, and she could not but appreciate this, even though the very intensity of his solicitude for her, the atmosphere of care with which he surrounded her, sometimes weighed upon her. Vronsky, meanwhile, in spite of the complete realization of what he had so long desired, was not perfectly happy. He soon felt that the realization of his desires gave him no more than a grain of sand out of the mountain of happiness he had expected. It showed him the mistake men make in picturing to themselves happiness as the realization of their desires. For a time after joining his life to hers, and putting on civilian dress, he had felt all the delight of freedom in general of which he had known nothing before, and of freedom in his love. He was soon aware that there was springing up in his heart a desire for desires ennui. Without conscious intention he began to clutch at every passing caprice, taking it for a desire and an object. Sixteen hours of the day must be occupied in some way, since they were living abroad in complete freedom, outside the conditions of social life which filled up time in Petersburg. As for the amusements of bachelor existence, which had provided Vronsky with entertainment on previous tours abroad, they could not be thought of, since the sole attempt of the sort had led to a sudden relations with the society of the place foreign and Russian, were equally out of the question owing to the irregularity of their position. The inspection of objects of interest, apart from the fact that everything had been seen already, had not for Vronsky, a Russian and a sensible man, the immense significance Englishmen are and just as the hungry stomach eagerly accepts every object it can get, hoping to find nourishment in it, Vronsky quite unconsciously clutched first at politics, then at new book, as he had from a child a taste for painting, and as, not knowing what to spend his money on, he had begun collecting engravings, he came to a stop at painting, began to take interest. He had a ready appreciation of art, and probably, with a taste for imitating art, he supposed himself to have the real thing essential for an artist, and after hesitating for some time, he appreciated all kinds, and could have felt inspired by any one of them. But he had no conception of the possibility of knowing nothing at all of any school of painting, and of being inspired. Since he knew nothing of this, and drew his inspiration, not directly from life, but indirectly from life embodied in art, his inspiration came very quickly and easily, more than any other style, he liked the French graceful and effective, and in that style he began to paint Anna's portrait in Italian costume, and the portrait seemed to him, and to every chapter nine the old neglected palazzo, with its lofty carved ceilings and frescoes on the walls, with its floors of mosaic, with its heavy yellow stuff curtains on the windows, 
with it the pose chosen by Vronsky with their removal into the palazzo was completely successful, and having, through Golanishchev, made acquaintance with a few interesting people, for a time he was sad. He painted studies from nature under the guidance of an Italian professor of painting, and studied medieval Italian life. Medieval Italian life so fascinated Vronsky that he even wore a hat and flung a cloak over his shoulder in the medieval style, which indeed was extremely becoming to him. Here we live and know nothing of what's going on, Vronsky said to Golanishchev as he came to see him one morning. Have you seen Mihailov's picture? He said, handing him a Russian gazette he had received that morning and pointing to an article on a Russian artist living in the very same town. The article reproached the government and the academy for letting so remarkable an artist be left without encouragement and support. I've seen it, answered Golanishchev. Of course, he's not without talent, but it's all in a wrong direction. It's all the event of Strauss reign in attitude to Kristen to religious painting. What is the subject of the picture? asked Anna. Christ before Pilate. Christ is represented as a Jew with all the realism of the new school, and the question of the subject of the picture having brought him to one of his favorite theories, Golanishchev launched forth into I can't understand how they can fall into such a gross mistake. Christ always has his definite embodiment in the art of the great masters, and therefore, if they want to depict, not God, but a revolutionist or a sage, let them take from history a Socrates, a Franklin, a Charlotte Corday, but not Christ. They take the very figure which cannot be taken for their art, and then, and is it true that this Mihailov is in such poverty? asked Vronsky, thinking that as a Russian Maecenas, I should say not. He's a remarkable portrait painter. Have you ever seen his portrait of Madame Vasilchikova? But I believe he doesn't care about painting any more portraits, and so very likely he is in want. I maintain that, couldn't we ask him to paint a portrait of Anna Arkadyevna, said Vronsky. Why mine, said Anna. After yours I don't want another portrait. Better have one of Annie, so she called her baby girl. Here she is, she added, looking out of the window at the handsome Italian nurse, who was carrying the child out into the garden, and immediately glancing unnoticed at Vronsky. The handsome nurse, from whom Vronsky was painting a head for his picture, was the one hidden grief in Anna's life. He painted with her as his model, admired her beauty and medievalism, and Anna dared not confess to herself that she was afraid of becoming jealous of this nurse, and was for that reason particular. Vronsky, too, glanced out of the window and into Anna's eyes, and, turning at once to Golanishchev, he said, Phew, you know this, Mihailov, I have met him, but he's a queer fish, and quite without breeding. You know, one of those uncouth new people ones so often coming across nowadays, one of those free thinkers you know, who are reared nimbly in theories of atheism, scepticism. In former days, said Golanishchev, not observing, or not willing to observe, that both Anna and Vronsky wanted to speak, in former days the free thinker was a man. Well, he's of that class. He's the son, it appears, of some Moscow butler, and has never had any sort of bringing up. When he got into the academy and made his reputation, he tried, as he's no fool, to educate himself, and he turned to what seemed to him the very source of culture, the magazines. In old times, you see, a man who wanted to educate himself, a Frenchman, for instance, would have set to work to study all the classics and theologians and tragedians and historians, but in our day he goes straight for the literature of negation, very quickly assimilates all the extracts of the science of negation, and he's ready. And that's not all twenty years ago he would have found in that literature traces of conflict with authorities, with the creeds of the ages. He would have perceived from this conflict that there was something else. In my article I, I tell you what, said Anna, who had for a long while been exchanging wary glances with Vronsky, and knew that he was not in the least interested in the education of this. But as the artist lived in a remote suburb, it was decided to take the carriage. 
An hour later, Anna, with Golanishchev by her side and Vronsky on the front seat of the carriage, facing them, drove up to a new ugly house in the remote suburb. On learning from the porter's wife, who came out to them, that Mihailov saw visitors at his studio, but that at that moment he was in his lodging only a couple of steps off, they sent her to him. Chapter 10 The artist Mihailov was, as always, at work when the cards of Count Vronsky and Golanishchev were brought to him. In the morning he had been working in his studio at his big picture. On getting home he flew into a rage with his wife for not having managed to put off the landlady who had been asking for money. I've said it to you twenty times, don't enter into details. You were fool enough at all times, and when you start explaining things in Italian you were a fool three times as foolish, he said after a long dispute. Don't let it run so long. It's not my fault. If I had the money, leave me in peace. For God's sake, my hell of shrieked with tears in his voice, and stopping his ears, he went off into his working room. Idiotic woman, he said to himself, sat down to the table, and, opening a portfolio, he set to work at once with peculiar fervor at a sketch he had begun. Never did he work with such fervor and success as when things went ill with him, and especially when he quarreled with his wife. Oh, damn them all, he thought as he went on working. He was making a sketch for the figure of a man in a violent rage. A sketch had been made before, but he was dissatisfied with it. No, that one was better. Where is it? He went back to his wife, and scowling, and not looking at her, asked his eldest little girl where was that piece of paper he had given them. The paper was... Still, he took the sketch, laid it on his table, and moving a little away, screwing up his eyes, he fell to gazing at it. All at once he smiled and gesticulated gleefully. That's it, that's it, he said, and, at once picking up the pencil, he began rapidly drawing. The spot of tallow had given the man a new pose. He had sketched this new pose, when all at once he recalled the face of a shopkeeper of whom he had bought cigars, a vigorous face with a prominent chin, and he sketched this very face. He laughed aloud with delight. The figure from a lifeless imagined thing had become living, and such that it could never be changed. That figure lived, and was clearly and unmistakably defined. The sketch might be corrected in accordance with the requirements of the figure, the legs, indeed, could and must be put differently, and the position of the left hand must be quite altered. The hair, too, might, but in making these corrections he was not altering the figure but simply getting rid of what concealed the figure. He was, as it were, stripping off the wrappings which hindered it from being distinctly seen. Each new feature only brought out the whole figure in all its force and vigor, as it had suddenly come to him from the spot of tallow. He was carefully finishing the figure when the cards were brought him. Coming, coming, he went into his wife. Come, Sasha, don't be cross, he said, smiling timidly and affectionately at her. You were to blame. I was to blame. I'll make it all right. And having made peace with his wife, he put on an alive green overcoat with a velvet collar and a hat, and went towards his studio, the successful figure he had already forgotten. Now he was delighted and excited at the visit of these people of consequence, Russians, who had come in their carriage. Of his picture, the one that stood now on his easel, he had at the bottom of his heart one conviction that no one had ever painted a picture like it. He did not believe that his picture was better than all the pictures of Raphael, but he knew that what he tried to convey in that picture no one ever had conveyed. This he knew positively, and had known a long while, ever since he had begun to paint it. But other people's criticisms, whatever they might be, had yet immense consequence in his eyes, and they agitated him to the depths of his soul. Any remark, the most insignificant, that showed that the critic saw even the tiniest part of what he saw in the picture, agitated him to the depths of his soul. He always attributed to his critics a more profound comprehension than he had himself, and always expected from them something he did not himself see in the picture. 
and often in their criticisms he fancied that he had found this. He walked rapidly to the door of his studio, and in spite of his excitement he was struck by the soft light on Anna's figure as she stood in the shade of the entrance listening to Golanishchev, who he was himself unconscious how, as he approached them, he seized on this impression and absorbed it, as he had the chin of the shopkeeper who had sold him the cigars and put it away somewhere to 